You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome, everybody, to um, another class of PAS 892, Exemplary Practices in Catholic Teaching and Learning, uh, brought to you uh, by Holy Apostles College and Seminary, and being shared with you through uh, WCAT TV and WCAT Radio. I'd like to... um, uh, welcome today's speaker, uh, Sister Mauricia Weber, uh, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Please, Father Peter, go ahead. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom. Pray for us. Saint Therese of Lisieux. Pray, Pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 All right. I'll begin with uh, the introduction of uh, Sister Marisha Weber. Sister Marisha is a board-certified physician specializing in psychiatry with a fellowship in consulting liaison psychiatry. She completed her residency and training at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She earned a master's degree in theology from Notre Dame and practiced psychiatry at her religious institute's multidisciplinary clinic, Sacred Heart Mercy Health uh, Care Center in Alma, Michigan from 1988 to 2014. In 2014, Sister Marisha has accepted the role of director of the Office of Consecrated Life for the Archdiocese of St. Louis, where she is also a member of the Archdiocesan Review Board, the Child Safety Committee, a facilitator for Project Rachel, Chair of the Board of Directors for My Catholic Doctor and an Executive Board Member for the St. Louis Guild of the Catholic Medical Association and Executive Board Member for the Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology. It's based out of the um, Cardinal Regali Center in St. Louis. Sister also serves as an adjunct clinical instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Additionally, Sister Marisha has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals and has authored a number of books in chapters, including a chapter in uh, the recent book by, uh, edited by Bishops Cousins and Estevez called Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers. Sister Marisha is a highly sought-after speaker and expert and has presented to the Curia at the Vatican in 2002 regarding the sexual abuse by clergy in North America. So um, with that introduction, I want to add that Sister Marisha is the kind of person I want to be when I grow up. I consider her a dear friend and colleague. Sister Marisha, um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Sebastian, for your very kind introduction. Well, it's a privilege to be here with you to discuss a topic that's very important to all of us involved in seminary formation. And in this presentation, I'll discuss markers of human maturation in seminary formation, which really begs the question, you know, can human and spiritual maturation really be evaluated in the external forum? And I would say, yes, that this is indeed the case. But I want to make it clear that I have a high regard both for the internal and the external fora, and I don't want to violate them. But I would like to suggest that maybe we need to look at how to reframe these and maybe redirect these, not eliminate them, but maybe look in a slightly more expansive way at these four and how they actually literally do work together. And we get this suggestion from the documents on the church, specifically on priestly life. In PPF 86, we read, candidates must give evidence of having interiorized their seminary formation. And PPF 95 indicates that there is evidence that not only internal attitudes, motivations and commitments are necessary, but external behaviors as well. So in other words, there needs to be an integration between the interior of what's going on inside of a man and what, how that manifests itself exteriorly if you're gonna truly have somebody who's integrated, which, which has to do with affective maturity. 
And I think you would agree that if somebody is not able to speak about his relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ or the Blessed Mother, which also is very important with regards to then celibacy, then if that is kind of a disconnect, you know, you would wonder, is this somebody that we really want to ordain? Is he more compartmentalized in a way where he's saying things outwardly, but inwardly, they're not quite fitting together. And I think that's part of the challenge for seminaries and dioceses to come up with some kind of strategy, some kind of instrument that will really allow human maturation and spiritual life of a man to really be reflected in some kind of evaluation or observational process. And I've made this proposal in doing such a strategy in my um, chapter in the book, The Art of Accompaniment, Markers on Human Maturation in, Se in Seminary Formation, Becoming a Gift for Others. And so I think that basically most of you are very aware of the process of what we look to in a man. So there's kind of uh, stages of affective maturity and evidence. So is a man um, you know, aware of, let's say the topic of celibate chastity? Is he maybe not even understand this aspect of free formation and really doesn't quite know how to speak about it? Um, you wonder if, you know, is there a problem with he's being maybe clueless about this topic in the extreme? Or is he giving you kind of a vague general description of celibate chastity such that you almost feel like he's reading uh, Webster's definition to you? And he's not giving you evidence of specific examples in his life. And you may not be experiencing examples in his life either. Or do you see that there's kind of an integration between what he's saying about celibate chastity and he's able to give you some example that is observable out in you know, the public with others in relationship to others. And you are also seeing this in him or the formation team is seeing this in him. So consider some of the, these questions as a means of ascertain whether or not he's integrating celibate chastity in his own life. Um, can he even talk about celibate chastity and his relationship to Christ, Christ's celibate chastity? Is he able to name ways in ways maybe celibate chastity helps protect and enable him to be a gift for others? And can he speak joyfully about remaining celibate for the sake of the kingdom? Does he have a desire for a wife and children? Does he even um, desire to speak about this with you? And if he doesn't have a desire, how does this fit in with him? And if he does have that desire, is he able to transform that towards spiritual paternity? Does he have sexual desires? What is he doing with them? Is he sharing them with you? Has he acted out on them? Does he repress them? Does he speak to the Blessed Mother about them, to Christ himself? How is he handling his successes and failures in these strivings? So basically, the tool that I'm proposing, you know, is not intended to be exhaustive as a framework, and it's meant to be developed and enriched with a prayerful creativity of all of you in seminary formation. So I'd like to read from 272 in the priestly program um, of formation that states, since formation assumes that a seminarian will be growing both in God's grace and in his free response to that grace, it's important that there be a process to note the markers of that growth. And the chapter in the art of accompaniment that I've written offers, I think, observational questions. And um, basically, um, these stages of development are listed. They, they befit um, psycho all psychological theories of how one moves to another. But again, since we don't grow in delineated dis distinct stages, that you'll see the markers overlap. Um, and I've used the um, descriptors of self-awareness towards self-knowledge. Once you have a little bit of knowledge about what you're doing, you can move it to self-direction. Then that's more self-control. You're developing a habit, self-discipline, self-governance, a little bit of a virtue here, and then spiritual fatherhood. So that's kind of um, the way that I've outlined this tool so that once you actually have a, an observational example of a marker, 
then the former is better equipped to write a focused narrative of his level of affective functioning, as well as look at where he has room to grow and what he's born fruit of in his formation process. So I'd like to look at this in, in the context of analyzing two scenarios together. And this is in a handout that Sebastian emailed out to you. Um, so I'll read scenario number one. Jonathan is an intelligent and affable 20 year old college student studying computer engineering who believes he has a calling to the priesthood. He's the youngest of four boys. He contacts you requesting to be a seminary candidate for your diocese. After your initial meeting with him, he offered that two of his older married brothers were molested as children by a priest laicized in 2008, who is their maternal uncle. His brothers were abused before Jonathan was born. He learned of his brother's abuse when he was 10 years old. Two of his brothers no longer practice their Catholic faith. Jonathan fears that if he pursues a vocation to the priesthood, that his brothers will not want him around their children. He asked the brother who was never molested if his fear was warranted and he was reassured that it was not. He did not ask the two brothers not practicing their faith because they have less contact with the family and he already feels vulnerable during this time of discernment. He also stated that if he could choose a vocation, he would choose married life not priesthood. You meet with this young man to assess whether he seems to have the necessary affective suitability for seminary formation. He was cooperative during the interview. He described having empathy for his brother's lack of trust of church authority persons while clearly stating that he did not make general conclusions from the painful particular situation regarding his uncle who was laicized. Jonathan described his prayer life as consisting of daily attendance at mass, praying the divine office, regular confession, meeting with his spiritual director. His dating experiences did not include sexual activity because he, quote, did not want to offend God. He complained that this was a sad time in his life as two of his brothers were verbalizing details of their abuse, which he had never heard before. Is this young man a healthy candidate for seminary formation? I'll address this question after considering the next scenario. Scenario number two. Francis is a 29 year old first year theologian who was described by the vocation director and seminary formation team as shy, anxious, and a people pleaser. He did well academically his first two years of seminary. This year, the seminarians have a parish experience in addition to their classwork. Francis expressed feeling overwhelmed and asked for extra time to complete his several coursework assignments because he was, quote, freezing up. You and others note that he was spending more time in his room. He's coming in late to breakfast and generally looks more tired. He's often quick-tempered yet remorseful and contrite after he lashes out. He always apologizes for lashing out and expresses the intention to not do so again. You meet with Francis and ask how things are going for him. He tells you about his anxiety, which he blames on the pastor at his parish assignment. The pastor told him to take more initiative in preparing two RCIA classes he was assigned to lead. He believes that the pastor does not want him at his parish and is not giving him sufficient guidance. You ask him, has he tried to, how has he tried to address this concern? He responds by telling you that playing online games helps him relax, and then he works on the RCIA classes. He also tells you for the first time that his father was an alcoholic who was very critical of him, and just about everything he did was not good enough. Francis grew up afraid of not doing well enough because he feared rejection. His father's been deceased 12 years. Francis has not acted out sexually nor abused alcohol. He expressed a desire to grow in his prayer life, which used to be an anchor for him. But it's much harder to pray now because of his anxiety. 
he wonders if this is a sign that he is called to marriage. So in both scenarios, aspects of human strengths and deficits are present. And what are some significant markers of maturation which suggest suitability for priestly formation? What are markers which suggest deficiencies in maturation? Which deficiencies can potentially be worked through during seminary formation? The psychotherapy, what kinds of deficiencies mitigate against the viability of a vocation? I'll next highlight aspects of these important considerations. So I'd like to begin by looking at scenario number one and considering the first marker of maturation, which is self-awareness to self-knowledge. And those of you who have the book, um, the, the full description of this marker is on page 36. So I'll just give just little highlighted bullets of them as we move along. So um, somebody who's exhibiting this maturational marker um, it entails the capacity to understand one's thoughts and feelings and how these relate to behavior. So questions that you might ask someone who exhibits healthy emotional self-awareness, the ability to acknowledge his feelings, emotional stability, a desire to gain a more complete and accurate knowledge of his motivations, appropriate self-disclosure, does he manifest a willingness to admit to mistakes, is he appropriately self-reliant with a capacity to trust himself, yet at the same time to rely on and entrust himself to others? Does Jonathan demonstrate these? And I'm going to ask you to participate here so you can unmute yourself. Would anybody like to offer a, uh, a response? I can help get you going. Didn't he express his feelings in a, in a, during a vulnerable time? So the first marker is his ability to acknowledge his feelings. You know, so he could say this during this time, he's thinking about being called to the priesthood, given his brother's history of molestation by his their priest uncle. And does he appropriately express these feelings? Are they congruent with the situation? Would you say yes? Yes. I would, I, I would say yes, Sister Marisha. Okay, okay. Anything else? Would it be possible that he would be holding anything back, having uh, expressed that much? And he might be. We need to, you know, this is just the first marker. We need to kind of learn a little bit about him. But, you know, he's at least not bleeding boundaries with his emotions. He doesn't seem to vicariously take on his brother's mistrust of church authority. You know, he's saddened by the details of their abuse, but he doesn't become mistrustful of the church and authority persons. And so there's a way in which, you know, um, he, he's trying to gain a, an accurate and, and uh, acknowledgement of his feelings and where they come from, and yet they're not bleeding over to what somebody else is thinking or feeling. So let's look then at what you would anticipate the individual has limited self-knowledge. So it's, and this is on page 37 if you have the book. A seminarian who's limited in his ability to reflect upon his emotions and thoughts and how they relate to behaviors demonstrates tendencies toward emotional turmoil and anxiety. So questions that you might look to to assess whether a seminarian exhibits limited self-knowledge. Are the seminarian's relationships needy and emotionally charged? Do his relationships terminate in frustration because of neediness or emotional outburst? Does he withdraw when emotionally conflicted? exhibit excessive ingratiating behaviors, feel undervalued, maybe more self-focused, frequently avoiding acknowledging his own faults and not want to take responsibility for decisions he's made. So how would you assess Francis regarding this marker of self-knowledge? What qualities did you see in that scenario that bespeak maybe some of these um, observations? I would say, Sister Marisa, most simply, he's projecting his father onto his parish priest. So there's some of that bleed over that you talked about. Yes, yes. And, and this, you, this is where you're going to see really the overlap in the markers. Um, so he's, you know, he's anxious, quick tempered, and his relationships seem to kind of terminate in frustration because of his neediness and emotional outburst. He seems to lack self-reflection. Um, he doesn't really see the connection between his behaviors and then the consequent emotional stirs that he experiences. And in fact, he blames his behaviors on others. You know, I didn't do the assignment, I couldn't do it, and I froze up. Why? Because the parish priest didn't give me enough guidance or attention. So exactly. Um, so, you know, he, he um, you know, because he feels the pastor doesn't like him, 
but the pastor is trying to make him more accountable to what is expected in the assignment. And so we can see this, but it's helpful to kind of break down that lack of self-awareness. Because if we're not aware of something, we can't bring it to self-knowledge. Once we have some self-knowledge, then we can do something about it. So this is a rudimentary marker, but it's a very important one to kind of get us going, so to speak. So clearly, Francis demonstrates this limitation. The next marker is self-direction. And it's the basis for evolving personal autonomy without undue self-doubt or ambivalence, you know, on page 39. And this is necessary for cooperation in which there's neither excessive submissiveness nor willfulness. So questions that might reflect this marker of maturation, um, you might consider, is the seminar able to receive criticism with docility and address it? Does he exhibit appropriate initiative? Can he accept a difficult situation and function within it? You know, has he achieved a capacity to differ with others' opinions without dismissing those with whom he disagrees? And is he comfortable in the presence of authority persons without antagonism or withdrawal from relationship? Does Jonathan exhibit these markers? Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> In, in this sense, I mean, he, re he reached out to a brother of his, right? Yep. So there's a little bit of initiative there, but yep. that's the safer space. And the more difficult space with his other brothers, he's not willing or not able to go there yet. So a little bit of yes and a little bit of Yes, yes. Okay, exactly. And, um, you know, he's, he's at least able to take initiative to be this transparent with the vocation director, so and say, this is kind of the mixed feelings I have here, and I'm not really too sure. So he's willing to seek you out for counsel. So there's some initiative there. And he's talking about a difficult situation. Um, and he's gotten kind of this indirect, you know, criticism about the church in general that he's heard about, and yet, you know, is trying to address it. So these are, again, again, these are just little bubbles up, you know, that kind of give you kind of a uh, give painting strokes of a picture here, you know, that you kind of will build on as you move along. But they're, they're helpful to look to specific observational examples in a scenario like this. So if we look at limited um, self-direction, a seminarian struggling with limited self-direction can be impulsive, rigid, difficulty making everyday decisions. Um, he may um, be excessively compliant or lack personal autonomy or initiative. And questions to consider that might suggest limited self-direction. Does a seminarian prefer to have others make decisions for him? Does he demonstrate excessive self-compliance? Is he lacking, is he rigid or lacking a capacity for flexibility in interactions? You, know, you can kind of look at the rest of them. I won't read them all off. But you can see that, you know, Jonathan doesn't seem to exhibit some of these limitations, but Francis does. So what do you hear in the scenario that bespeak some of these markers of limited self-direction in Francis? I would say in many ways, it's what Francis didn't do as much as what he did do. He didn't seek out the counselor. He didn't go to visit the professors beforehand. I didn't hear him talking to his formation advisor or whoever say, hey, this is the struggle I'm having. Can you help me do this? So it's what he didn't do as much as what he Yeah, he, you know, there's such inaction in him. He doesn't take responsibility for his, for his actions. And so he just hides himself, get it all tightened up in a ball, which probably contributes to this experience of freezing up. He's got all of this emotional turmoil all bottled up inside that's not connecting with what's going on outside. So again, a sign of compartmentalizing aspects of his life that manifest themselves in, you know, somebody who's in an emotional turmoil and is not verbal about what's stirring inside it. It could be worked with. If he can kind of share some of these, somebody can then walk with him and help guide him towards moving past what is clearly a wound that he has. So it's not the end of the story. But if he doesn't reach out and is not allowing himself to be accompanied, and this is where a good formator will hopefully be able to unpack that with him and for him, he's going to remain stuck and frozen like he has been for so many years of his life. So, you know, that, that would be unfortunate, but you see that pretty clearly. 
So the next marker, self-control, and that's page 42 of the book, entails establishing the motivation for necessary change, setting clear goals and monitoring behaviors towards the goal. A seminary with self-control is able to delay gratification for future good. He has the capacity to realistically anticipate and plan for future potential difficulties. So what would you anticipate from an individual who exhibits self-control? Does a seminary exercise responsible stewardship and use of his time and resources? A healthy sense of pride and self-confidence in his work? Is he able to delay gratification for a future or greater good? Does he have the capacity for balancing harmony and diversity? Does he experience a heightened sense of fulfillment through collaboration with others? Does he encourage those with whom he's working to search for the good in others' ideas? So how would you assess Jonathan in this marker? Stewardship of his time and resources. Delaying gratification. It seems to me I want to ask two, I'm not sure yet, because I want to ask some questions about him. Okay. How, how is he, is he preparing to ask his older brothers about how he can interact with them? And also, where is he around? Well, if, if I could choose my vocation, I would choose marriage. Well, how is Jesus toward your desires? And does Jesus respect your desires? And do you present those desires to Jesus? So if he's not bringing those into prayer, he's just stuffing them, then okay. that's not really genuine self-control. Okay, okay. And mind you, he's 20 years old. He's wondering about applying to the priesthood. And so... You know, everything you're saying is absolutely right. And then you got to factor in kind of his particular unique situation. So do you see, you know, any place in this scenario where he, in his 20-year-old kind of query about possibly being called, that he's able to, um, you know, have some kind of um, responsible stewardship or um, delaying gratification? He talks about... Um, you know, his prayer life consisting of regular attendance at mass, praying the divine office, regular confession, meeting with the spiritual director, and his dating experience didn't include um, sexual activity because he didn't want to offend God. So there's just some capacity for, um, you know, an orderly life that you see in this young man. So again, it's, it's, another, it's just a brush stroke, and all these other factors are also there that will need to be explored a little bit later. Um, and, you know, it, maybe it won't be necessary to ask his brothers right now, maybe later on, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a kind of a give and take kind of situation, but there are some signs that he is able to have aspects of an orderly life at age 20. Um, and so that gives you a little nugget about that. And then with regards to limited self-control, inferiority and inadequacy are common experiences for a seminarian who struggles with self-control. He doesn't feel competent or valued in his efforts and is critical of others and himself. So questions, does he exhibit strong emotional reactions when someone crosses him? Does he feel maybe incompetent or undervalued? Is he excessively critical of others or himself? Does he seem to lack a sense of joy in authentic self-giving, bothered by feelings of inferiority and inadequacy? So what can you say about Francis in this marker? Anybody else have any anything to say? Oh, I wonder, um, Sister Marisha, and this is yes. just a um, a question about the uh, the way in which um, we look at uh, whether a seminarian exhibits limited self control uh -huh. or w whether he exhibits uh, self control. Is it possible for a seminarian to exhibit self control in some of these areas and limited self control in others? Absolutely, absolutely. And so if, you, if you're thinking of Jonathan, you know, where is it that he maybe has difficulty with, um, you know, some of his emotionals? You know, it's, um, he feels inadequate. That immobilizes him to the point of hindering his capacity for daily function in some areas. And he seems to be judgmental and blaming others for his difficulty. You know, and he might seek pleasurable outlets when under stress which adds to his social impairments, like surfing the net when he feels a little overwhelmed by preparing the RCIA class. Um, he turns in assignments late. 
is like for community exercises, kind of a black and white kind of person, you know, there's kind of a rigidity in his mind view. So there's lacking kind of a flexibility or initiative to consider healthier alternatives to problem solve some of his concerns. So that's kind of where, you know, he's, I think, manifesting some of that um, in, in um, is the way he's handling his parish assignment. So the next maturational marker is, is self-discipline and requires motivation to achieve core values or habits. And this process requires change and adaptation, gradually transforming how one sees oneself and how one interacts with others in various circumstances. And a seminary who exhibits a balanced self-discipline can demonstrate some realistic problem-solving skills. So questions that you might ask to assess whether seminary exhibits self-discipline. Does he exhibit appropriate interpersonal boundaries? Does he relate respectfully to men and women? Does he exercise discretion in his use of technology, choice of entertainment? Does he make choices that enable him to refrain from addictive behaviors, from alcohol, internet use? Does he demonstrate realistic problem-solving skills? And how would you assess, you know, Jonathan in, in this um, marker? You know, what, from, what you, from what you heard, there's a lot more to ask. But when you're meeting someone and this is the first time, you know, from what you heard, does he exhibit any of these self-discipline um, qualities? As you said, Sister Marisa, his sexual history looks good for him there. Even if the motivation is fear, that, that's imperfect, but it's still, he's got some discipline there in emotionally charged situations. Yes, yes. And he seems to have good interpersonal boundaries and respectful of his brother's experiences without, you know, taking on their emotions and seems to be able to, you know, for, forgive the church a little bit. And yet, you know, so, I mean, again, these are just, you know, brush strokes that we're trying to get in a scenario that you're going to continue to walk with a seminarian, you know, weekly observe him daily if you're living at the seminary or, or teaching there daily over time. So this gets, this picture gets much richer, um, but it's a way to kind of consider some of these, you know, observational um, characteristics that you can then reflect on. Um, and he seems to be stable in his male sexual identity, you know, ostensibly dating this woman. Um, and, you know, there's some tension relationship and seems to at least be able to maneuver that all right for his 20 years old. Um, so he's exhibiting some of those. Um, and if you look at the limited, you know, ones, it's, you know, enmeshed, poor interpersonal boundaries, um, more acquaintances than friendships, relies heavily on the role he plays with a sense of adequacy. You don't really hear that so much in Jonathan, but you do hear some of that for sure in Francis. And, and I think that comparative, um, Limited versus, you know, giving signs of it can also be helpful. So, so what do you hear in um, in Francis in in this marker? Could, could I have a question? A question? Yes. 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 I just a clarification on distinguishing self control and self discipline. I understand the distinction between self awareness, self direction, but it's not clear in my mind sufficiently yet how self discipline really is distinct in a um, helpful way for me from self-control? Very so good question. Yes. So um, self-control. So once, like if I'm not aware that, um, let's say I'm, you know, very anxious about um, an exam. And so I go and eat a lot of cookies. And then I'm realizing, you know, it's not really helping me. And then somebody says, well, do you know? Da, da, da. So then I say, okay, now I'm more aware that this is a coping mechanism that's not very healthy for me. Um, so once I'm aware of that, then with self-control, then maybe I won't get the cookies. But with self-discipline, the thing is, I now have a habit where I'm reflecting even more deeply about what it is um, that... Um, that achieves more of what I want to do. So it's a change of adaptation. It's not just, I'm gonna control and not eat the cookies, but I'm kind of looking at my, you know, my pattern of going to get cookies. And instead I'm going to say, okay, I need to deal with my anxiety. And that's going to help me then 
more focus on what I need to do on this assignment. So it's a more, it's a deeper integrated kind of situation where you're developing more, um, you're, you're developing towards um, a habit of, of how you're doing this, not just withdrawing from something, but um, it, it's, um, it's a change and adaptation that gradually transform how you see yourself and how you interact in a particular situation with a deeper um, awareness of who you are and what you're about. So it's not just behavior modification. You're beginning to integrate some of that into how I know myself and what I might choose to do that will really give me a freedom because I'm aware that I, you know, I can get stuck here or I'm aware that I can seek counsel. And so there, you have a, a greater awareness of, of how that plays part. It's not just more a modifying behavior, which is more self-control, but it's more um, an, an integrated aspect of my motivations and how I can adapt those for a healthier um, self. Th does that help? That helped. I took some notes. It's just, it wasn't clear. So now it's clearer. Thank you, sister. Thank you. And also, I just for the sake of time, a, a more detailed description of each marker is in the book itself. And so there's be a little bit more there for you to look for. But thank you for the question. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so for uh, limited discipline, may seek self gratifying behaviors, um, but really doesn't address. So, and I'll read a little bit more of the description here of limited self-discipline from the book. A seminar who exhibits limited self-discipline may seek self-gratifying behaviors, overeating, alcohol, abuse, sexual activity, for example, as a means to avoid stress, loneliness, or frustration. But, you know, it's, it doesn't identify really what the issue is. And so he's unsure and kind of relies on external behaviors rather than, you know, becoming more understanding of what it is that's really stirring inside of him and addressing that in a way that gives him freedom. Because we all have areas of limitation. We all have areas maybe of woundedness to address. But how do we embrace those? How do we then say, okay, this is mine. What I'm going to do with it, how I'm going to work with it. That's when you're beginning to get freer in the discipline. But if we don't see this in, in Francis at this point, I mean, he's accusing his pastor of not wanting him to be the parish. Just like you said, um, Ed, it's a sign of projection. You know, he's putting his father onto him. And so there's a poor interpersonal boundaries. You know, he's just not saying, well, this is me and this is my father who suffers with alcoholism. And because the pastor spoke with him about um, not preparing the RCIA classes, you know, he says, well, he doesn't like me. Again, a projection, not I don't like the feedback I'm getting from the pastor. Um, so he deals with this anxiety and stress by kind of escaping into the world wide web and surfing the web. And he doesn't seem to have those satisfying relationships with adults. And his relationships seem to be a bit superficial. It's not transparent, not straightforward. And he does seem to lack some realistic problem solving skills um, in the way he's addressing conflicts and the way he's addressing his concerns. So the next marker is um, self-governance. A person who exhibits self-governance has integrated and consolidated previous attainments and is establishing decisive patterns for future adaptive functioning. That is, he not only takes the responsibility for his actions, but he's taking responsibility for kind of the quality of his actions. And so it's, it's, it's a deeper integration of how he's going to be, who he is. Um, and so there's a capacity for healthy friendship, uh, challenges in relationship part as a normal part of human bonding, and is working towards, you know, navigating all those aspects towards deeper interpersonal relationships. So does he demonstrate sound prudential judgment of his choices? Is he able to form relations that are responsible, respectful, marked by integrity, ability to forgive others and seek forgiveness for personal shortcomings? Does, does he understand suffering in his own life and respond accordingly? Does he show compassion for those who are suffering? Does he exhibit faithful perseverance and fulfilling commitments? You know, these kinds of things. Um, and with Jonathan, you know, we seem to see that he's able to forgive and seek forgiveness a little bit in a rudimentary way, has some compassionate, you know, reflection about the suffering that his brothers have, you know, endured and heard. Um, and, you know, he's working towards Thinking about celibacy, if he's called to priesthood, we're not really sure. Um, so those are rudimentarily there for him. And then with regards to self-governance, um, the, the limited aspect of it, 
So someone who has limited self-governance has difficulty controlling his own actions and responses. Choices are made, are not linked to any particular hierarchy of goods. He allows his emotions, just what comes up to kind of trigger his reactions or actions. And then he might exclude himself from being responsible because he was made uncomfortable in somebody else's fault and it's the situation's fault. So there's really not an integration of himself with what's really going on outside himself. So questions for this limited self-governance. Does he function properly in stressful or delicate situations? Does he fulfill commitments he's made? Are his relationships a bit more superficial? Does he li demonstrate limited sensitivity to the sufferings of others? Um, you know, and so how would you assess Francis in this particular marker of, of limited self-governance? Well, he exhibits several deficiencies. He's plagued with imperfections. He's kind of insecurity haunts him. He seems to fail to fulfill some basic, simple commitments. Um, and he has diff academic difficulties and it kind of freezes in his parish assignment. And then he begins to wonder, you know, freezing and anxiety, is that a sign that he should marry? You know, well, it's really not a sign that he should marry, you know, because he's, he's just, you know, he's freezing up. You know, so there's something in his imagination is always something else. So he doesn't seem to do well under stress and almost creates more stress than is actually present, um, you know, which is, which is difficult. Um, so the next marker, and again, I'm moving along a little bit with these because of the, the element of time, but it'll give you kind of a flavor for it and to look more deeply in some of the fuller descriptions that are in the chapter, but spiritual fatherhood. So St. John Paul II in Pastoris Dabovovi speaks of the priest as one called to make gift of self and likeness to Christ. And he says, the gift of self has no limits, marked as it is by the same apostolic and missionary zeal of Christ, the good shepherd who said, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will heed my voice, for there shall be one flock, one shepherd. So a seminary who demonstrated capacity for spiritual fatherhood has a disposition to minister to the needs of others. He's personally enriched by his self-gift. He has primary concern for the welfare and enrichment of others, and he doesn't shrink from self-sacrifice. And you'll see some of the questions listed there. And really for Jonathan, you know, he's just so young at age 20 that it's really not appropriate to try to assess this level of maturational marker spiritual fatherhood. So, you know, does he have the potential? We have to wait and see if you decide to admit him as a seminarian for your seminary. With regards to um, the limited disposition for spiritual fatherhood, struggles with generosity, seek self-aggrandizement, undue recognition, relationships that provide him status or human respect, kind of in short, a seminarian who does not demonstrate qualities of spiritual fatherhood will be limited in his capacity for self-sacrifice and altruism. You know, and what, what do you see in Francis? Does he exhibit some of these limited qualities? So more self-focused, isn't he? Yes doesn't seem to have a lot of capacity just because of this freezing up for, you know, self-sacrifice, um, kind of insensitive what's going on around him. So the capacity for self-sacrifice and, and altruism. So, it's, so when we look at, um, you know, the church documents, a seminary who has difficulty offering himself as a gift for others will lack the disposition necessary to enter into a new and fruitful relationship with the bride of Christ, the church and her members. So what can we say about Jonathan and Francis? First, Jonathan, already his young age of 20, he possesses many evolving um, qualities of maturation, though in the midst of some internal familial turmoil, he's able to keep his boundaries clear, yet remain empathic about his brother's sufferings. Most of all, he wants God's will for him while being honest that priesthood is not his preference. He also demonstrates a capacity for self-knowledge and that he knows that the mixed feelings about priesthood is not about his brother's history of molestation by their uncle, who, when he was functioning as a priest, but rather rooted in letting go of the married vocation for which he has a preference because he believes priesthood is a vocation God is calling him to. So, you know, would you say that Jonathan is possibly a good candidate for seminary formation? Okay, okay. So, and, um, you know, and again, Jonathan is, is someone, how would you, so if you accepted him to the seminary and go through all the, the more detailed testing, 
you know, how would you test his commitment to a vocation of the priesthood? You know, I would say first and foremost, you have to pray for Jonathan. He's kind of the candidate that you might not have accepted in seminary training because of his complex family history involving sexual molestation by clergy and his preference for marriage when he came to you that he though had a sense that God was calling him to the priesthood. So, you know, consider the following. You tell him to be forthright with the formation team regarding his ambivalence about a vocation to priesthood. You expect the formation team to explore this ambivalence and to communicate what is appropriate to the external form regarding growth and development in these areas. You periodically assess whether or not a conviction about his priestly vocation is emerging in the course of your formation meetings. Are you setting a time limit during which you will accept Jonathan's ambivalence about his vocation? I think those things would be very important in Jonathan's regard. So now we go, go to, um, to Francis. He has many areas of woundedness. He did to seem to do all right in his first couple of years of seminary, but he has difficulty now in his third year of, um, of this uh, theology. So what do he benefit from therapy? And if he engages in therapy and is transparent and docile with his formator, an evolving process of affective maturity may be possible for him. But if you believe that Francis has a vocation, how would you assess if he's made sufficient progress in areas of affective weakness to really endorse him to continue his seminary formation? With his permission, would you request a report from the therapist? I think that would be important. Appropriate consents that allow appropriate exchanges of information you know, with the formator as well about how a seminarian is doing who has been referred to therapy. What did the therapist tell you? Did he or she outline specific goals and assess for progress? Was a time frame for therapy established? Were you satisfied with the results of therapy? Is the therapist lacking in problem-focused approach to therapy? Do you need to consider another therapist who will better focus core issues that need to be addressed? Is the seminarian cooperating with therapy? Why or why not? Is that why he's not making progress? Is it due to his lack of motivation or a deeper, more core issue or problem? Are you relying solely on the therapist report to make your determination on how he's progressed? Really, you have the grace of your office as formators living in the seminary, the formation team, and you see a lot more than what one therapist might see once a week. So it's important for you to kind of look at what you observe and how you observe him speaking about his vocation, his evolving um, maturation. Do you have goals and objectives kind of outlined that are put in writing by the formation team? Does Francis know what those are? Does he have a copy of them? Are the goals attained clearly for a, st a stated um, time frame? You know, have you met regularly with Francis to assess his progress, give him feedback, very key, maybe a little direction, maybe a little correction? Is he striving for conversion? Does he address his faults and failures as opportunities to grow in a life of virtue and make realistic plans to do so? Are the outcomes and consequences clearly delimited if the, if the goals are not met? You know, maybe you'll recommend intensive therapy over the summer, uh, reassess whether or not he should continue. Um, and the documents suggest that, you know, if they need therapy, you know, longer than two years, maybe they need to be having a time out, have things addressed, and then, you know, reapply. That's something for the formation team to really look at together. So once you have gathered, once you've looked at a seminarian and looked at these markers and have examples of where you see this man manifesting either achieving this marker or suggesting limitations in this marker, and you gather all of these together, then you can put together a kind of narrative where you're looking at the seminary and strength. And so the narrative assessment, which is on page 40, 53 of the book, and I think is part of your handout. So what are the seminary strengths presently in a formation process? And give specific examples reflected in significant markers of human maturation. Where does he have room to grow? Give the specific examples reflected in some of those significant markers and list some practicals to address the vocational growth and development. You know, so for example, in Francis, if, you know, he's freezing up and he's afraid that he's, you know, not going to be like, you know, could you recommend that he pauses, ponders, thinks about, you know, what he's so afraid of and how he might address this differently, maybe seeking counsel, you know, help guide him as to how he can move beyond some of these areas of limitation, um, which I think would be helpful to him. 
So I've given you a, a bit of information right now in a very short period of time, uh, but I'd like to open it up to any questions or comments that you have. Again, this is a tool. It's something to be further built on and developed on, but I think it gives kind of a framework to work from that has been useful for individuals who have used it. Um, so I'll, st I'll stop here for now. Well, Sister Marisha, thank you so very much for, um, for walking us through how to use these markers in the assessment of uh, yes, a student's uh, readiness and, 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 and so on for, uh, for uh, formation. Uh, I have one question. Um, these are markers of affective maturity that are um, able to be visibly seen. Uh, so it would be um, uh, useful for uh, within the external form uh, for assessing uh, a student's human formation or a seminarian's human formation. Is there um, a relationship between this and uh, the internal form um, uh, and assessment of a student's um, or a seminarian's spiritual formation? And you bring up a very important, important point here. Um, and the last chapter of this book is actually was written by one of our sisters, Sister um, Joseph Marie Rusman. Um, she recently passed away. She was a canon lawyer and also a civil attorney. And she has a beautiful chapter looking at um, the history of internal and external form in the church, looking at the church documents. And, you know, basically what she outlines, you know, very accurately is the church documents speak of um, the confessor and spiritual director being the internal forum and no one else is included. So the spiritual director may not reveal any um, um, confidences or an opinion he has about the seminarian, but also the seminarian may reveal anything he wants to the spiritual director and that binds the spiritual director but it doesn't bind anyone else because this the seminarian himself is not bound to confidentiality he can speak to the formator about anything he wants as well and this the formator also really needs to look at some of these things that i talked about that really have to do with kind of the more the interior more private intimate aspect of celibate chastity which is the delicate area and how that's manifesting itself outside in his day-to-day -day living, which would be a very open um, external forum place to discuss some of these things, um, and so, but it would be done differently. So really the, the person who would limit what is expressed more deeply of what's inside is the seminary himself. The formator can maybe invite some questions or invite some observations for further discussion and if the seminary can refuse to, you know, speak about those more openly, which would be, you know, a limitation and unfortunate, something to discern a little bit more deeply, or he can choose to open that up a little bit more, yet keeping, you know, what would be into the internal form still in regards there, because the, the formator doesn't even necessarily know all of those particular details, but it's a way to bridge the gap between the two and realize that this man needs to be an integrated whole. Um, and, and some of these things then, you know, will cross over and blend together towards a composite integration of the person. Thank you, sister. These are great questions that, you know, we can use in spiritual direction, at least in, you know, to ask ourselves these questions. Can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. I think there, these are great markers. Um, and, and as you said, I mean, we can in, certainly encourage them as we look at these markers and see ones, you know, significantly lacking, then I think it's, it's a way to, um, I'm, I'm wishing our two seminary psychologists were here. We just found out about this. I'm sorry. I didn't get the, uh, the message about this meeting until just a couple hours ago, but um, yeah, I think these markers are going to be very helpful as we, as we meet with the men privately and then encourage them to bring it to external. And I think what's also helpful is, it gives you a guidepost where I would recommend not using it just once a year, but maybe, you know, looking at it in a month or a couple of months. And then the seminarian himself, when he sees what these markers are and what the questions are to ask himself, you know, that's how you bring something to awareness. It can help guide him as well. So it can be beneficial for the formator, formation team, as well as the seminarian himself, because he may not know 
how do I get to affective maturity? You know, it's not something that we necessarily learn. So it can help guide him as to what he needs to maybe tend toward and look how he can express in his own life, bring up with his um, spiritual director, bring up with his formator. And if he's in therapy with his therapist, so that I think it just uh, makes it open and less, hopefully less threatening because it's not intended to be, um, you know, needn't be afraid of our sexual feelings and thoughts. That's how God created us. But what, is, what are we doing with them? And how does have somebody help guide us given the culture that so many come from, which is really a difficult one to maneuver through um, as we know. It's important that both external and internal have the markers you know, so both sides were kind of looking at them and reviewing them with the men or helping them evaluate themselves. Yes. Well, we have, um, and thank you, um, Sister Marisha, for your presentation. We have another minute if anybody would like to uh, ask a final question. Yes. Uh, Robert? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Is that, there, I'll, is that okay? Yeah, uh, like first off, sister, I came uh, late to the party here, so to speak, uh, for reasons that I won't get in right now. Uh, but my apologies to you and uh, Sebastian and uh, the other um, uh, guests here. Uh, so I've been quiet and and very much into what you're saying, despite my, uh, at least for myself not answering questions because I didn't feel. I had, uh, I was trying to get a gist of what you were saying, but I will say for the last, I guess, 40 minutes or so, um, uh, I've learned a lot. And uh, I think the last thing that you said about sharing these questions uh, with the candidate, uh, uh, any candidate that wants to be a, a priest uh, is uh is another way of saying, and I think that it's good, you're teaching them to do this on their own. Yes, exactly. And it's not a question of I'm the teacher and I'm going to keep some of this stuff to myself, yes. but rather let me teach you how to do this when you leave here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've taught myself in life not, uh, how, <laughs> uh, not having anything to do with the priesthood, but uh, in teaching, uh, rather than direct somebody, uh, I would always say, I, uh, my job is to let you, have you learn what some people might think that I have some knowledge on. So that was a, a very important uh, thing for me to hear that I um, agree with totally. I think it's uh, paramount uh, in, in that's the job. In other Thank words, you. that's the job for the teacher, and that's the job for the uh, person being taught. Thank you, sister. And again, my apologies for being 20 minutes late. And thank you. I mean, that's what accompaniment is, isn't it? You accompany the man, you know, so there's a walking with, and it, it's really a conversatio. It's a dialogue between two, and that's really what enriches it. That's what helps build the relationship between the formator and you know, the seminarian and, you know, each one in the formation team, be that faculty, be that spiritual director, be that the formator, be that the counselor, the therapist, whatever, is when there's an exchange, it becomes a conversation that then we walk along with. And that's how we learn best of all. That's how we really integrate um, um, what we're trying to, to grow into. So thank you for your comment. I just want to add this short uh, phrase that happened yesterday between my wife and I have been blessed with a one in a billion wife, uh, you know, person in my wife. And we talked about our marriage and my wife said, we dance well together. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I think you get that. <laughs> I think it's uh, pertinent. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We dance well together, the teacher yeah. and the student and, uh, and of course, my wife is the teacher. <laughs> no, you get you get what I'm saying. Very cool. So, um, would uh, would somebody um, would you have a thought or anything else you want to say before we close in prayer, Sister Marisha? Was this helpful? Yes. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You, you know, um, uh, the exercise that you just did, uh, Sister Marisha, uh, 
uh, it helps reveal uh, the value, uh, the practical value of this book uh, for uh, seminary formation in general. So uh, I would encourage um, I would encourage people to uh, to get it, to study it, and to put it to use. Yeah, the, the, I also have a chapter in there on um, on communication. How do you really help unpack somebody's salvation history? Which is, you know, I think we're tempted to just kind of jump in rather than listen. And listen is such an art. It's, it's, it's an arduous labor to really listen to someone rather than say, oh, I know what you mean and I know what you're going to say, but really unpack it. And so there's different skills that I've outlined that can help seminaries kind of go deeper so that they really come to even verbalize their salvation history. Because so much, especially with these cell phones today, so much is not verbalized. You know, come, the cell phone comes at them like this, but for them to kind of ponder and pray, and then begin to speak to and experience, many of them actually have not done that as much as we might have decades ago. So it's, it's a way to have them become more aware and then accompany them in what they're revealing and then reflect with you as you become a mirror for them, but they really are the primary person there. You know, but they, it's a seminary who has a primary obligation for his uh, formation, which the documents so beautifully and accurately say. Well, let's, uh, let's end in, um, in prayer. Uh, if you would, Father Brandon, um, uh, as technical difficulties prevented you from uh, beginning us in prayer, would you close us in prayer? Well, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your many blessings. And we thank you for all that we've learned today. And we thank you for Sister Marisa and her great gift to the church, her work. We ask you, Lord, to bless us in all of our respective work to try to form good, holy, healthy, balanced priests for the church. Blessed Mother Mary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Our guardian angels and patron saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. God bless you all in doing this important work. Thank you, sister. Thank you. God bless you as well, sister. Thank you. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. To a production of WCAT Radio, please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.